The Floating House by Scott Russell Sanders, illustrated by Helen Cogancherry. In the winter of 1815, was, it was so cold, the Ohio River froze from shore to shore. Wayne and Bertie McClure and their two children, Mary and Jonathan, huddled in the cabin of their flatboat, wrapped in quilts, listening to the ice groan and creak like the stairs in an old house. Their boat still rested on dry land in Pittsburgh, along with hundreds of other flatboats, keelboats, skiffs and scows, canoes, barges, and rafts, even a few newfangled steamboats, all waiting for the spring thaw to open the river. Then one morning, after a week of sunshine, the McClure's woke to a sound like thunder. They looked out to see the green ice cracked into slabs and black water showing through. Look, Mary cried, the river's yawning. Sleepy old river, said Jonathan. The current soon swept the river clear. Everybody started launching boats, one family helping another. Those looking for new land, like the McClure's, were eager to reach the wild country downstream, where you could buy farms for a dollar an acre, and where the dirt was so rich, people said you could plant a stick and it would break out in leaves. In a crowd of boats, the McClure's set off. The swifter boats pulled away, leaving the McClure's to drift in company with a few other families. Mr. McClure balanced on the cabin roof and steered with a long sweeping oar. Mrs. McClure read aloud from the Navigator, a book of advice for travelers on the Ohio. The horse, the cow, the mule, and the pig rode behind the cabin, munching corn, thumping the deck. The children rode up front with the wagon and plow among barrels, bundles, and tools. Mary and Jonathan were a little afraid to feel the boat rocking, but they were also excited to be riding the great river at last. Their job was to watch for sandbars and snags and to give a holler if they saw any danger ahead. Despite their hollering, sometimes the flatboat struck a soggy stump or scraped a rock, and sometimes it grounded on gravel or sand. When that happened, Mr. and Mrs. McClure would wade in the shallows and shove with poles, and other travelers would lend a hand until the boat slid free. <coughs> Every bump made the horse whinny and prance. From inside the cabin, Mary and Jonathan sang funny songs to calm him. By day, they floated lazily downstream about the speed of a person walking. If the morning was foggy, Mr. McClure judged the distance to shore by throwing stones and listening for a splash or a thud. If they met a steamboat chugging upriver or a keelboat gliding along with its crew of grunting men, Mary blew hard on the tin horn and Jonathan yelled, Flatboat coming! Every afternoon before sunset, the McClure's tied up the bank along with four or five other boats. The children pulled in trot lines to see if their fish, what fish had been caught, and they gathered driftwood for fires. They refilled water barrels from the river, but let the mud settle out before drinking. The mothers traded food and lantern oil and stories. The fathers hunted deer and turkey for supper, then took turns all night standing guard. Before falling asleep, Mary and Jonathan watched embers glowing in the sandbox on deck. They smelled sawdust from the poplar and walnut lumber their father had used in building the boat, and the tar he had used for caulking the joints. They smelled tallow from the candles their mother made. They listened to owls hoot and wolves howl. Even on windless nights, they heard limbs crashing in the woods. 
and always, beneath every other sound, they heard the lap and stir of the river. The farther they journeyed, the wilder the land appeared. There were clearings for homesteads and occasional towns, but mostly the shores were thick with trees, still brown and bare from the hard winter. Grapevines looped from trunk to trunk, and nests clotted the branches. Eagles and hawks circled overhead. Bears swam across the current, snorting black eyes gleaming. And once the whole river was blocked by a churning carpet of squirrels, As the flatboat glided along, people called from shore, Hello, the boat! Hello, the shore! The children called back. What place is this? Steubenville, the people might answer. Or Wheeling, Marietta, Point Pleasant, Gallipolis, Maysville. So many mysterious names. Jonathan and Mary had never before set foot outside Pennsylvania, and here within a month they would see Ohio and Western Virginia. Kentucky and Indiana. And that was where they were headed, to a settlement named Jeffersonville across the river from Louisville at the falls of the Ohio. How will we know the place? the children asked. You'll hear the roar of the rapids, their mother said. How long until we get there? they kept asking. A good while, their father answered. Then he said a week, then only a few days. The children listened for a waterfall. They studied every island, every bluff, every field planted with spindly orchards, every log cabin surrounded by stumps. Would the house they built in Indiana look like those lonesome cabins? Just when it seemed they had reached the edge of the world, they came to Cincinnati, a city as large as Pittsburgh, all chimneys and church spires. The wharves were covered were crowded with ships. The streets rang with hammers, clattered with carts, puffed and puffed with steam engines. They floated on past settlements with names like Lawrenceburg and Madison. At last, one day, about noon, Mary and Jonathan heard a low rumble, like the sound of an empty barrel rolling on the floor. They stared ahead and saw rolling on the floor. Oh, they stared ahead and saw the water foaming white. Rocks, they shouted. Those must be the falls, their father said. And that must be Louisville, their mother said, pointing to the sizable town on the left bank. So that must be Jeffersonville, their father said, steering the boat toward a village on the right bank. <coughs> no sooner had the McClure's tied up at dock than dogs came running to sniff them and the children came running to meet them and folks of all ages came to help unload the flatboat. From the government office, the McClure's bought a parcel of land overlooking the falls. Before dark, with more help from these new neighbors, they dismantled the boat, hauled the lumber to their farm, and began building a house with the very same wood. Back on dry land, Mary and Jonathan could still hear the river. It poured through their minds, waking and sleeping. Sometimes, on windy nights, when the rapids were roaring, the children imagined their house might lift from its foundation, slide down the bank, and go riding the river once more, heading downstream to unknown places.